What's up, Mountain Movers Church? Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we are pumped this morning because we have some very, very special friends of ours that are joining us. But it started back in 97 when I was in Jeff City, Missouri. Had just rededicated my life to the Lord, got involved in our, our student ministry there. And there was this young punk kid, 14 years old, by the name of Brandon Kelly. And I watched this punk grow into a man that loves God with all of his heart. And you know, there's some people in, in seasons of our lives that you move from one season to the next and you never see them again. You know, it's like you graduate from high school and it's like it's, uh, you think back and it's like that was a totally different world and a totally different time and it's almost surreal. But then there's people that it's just ordained by God. It's just part of his plan that he brings people along, relationships that you've built throughout the years and he allows those relationships to continue from one season to the next. And this is one of those relationships. We ended up actually in Bible college together, and, uh, and we've just seen him grow and seen him mature in ministry. And, and then, you know, Misty and I go to plant Mountain Mover, what you know as Mountain Movers Church, and we head to camp, and guess who the directors are? <laughs> Brandon and Becca Kelly, amazing, amazing friends of ours. We love them so much. We're so glad that they're here today. That's right. They do a fantastic job together at camp, and they asked me, my kids asked this morning, is Becca speaking with Brandon? And I was like, you know what? Becca's about to have a baby in like two to four weeks, so she's not probably going to speak today because we don't want to deliver right here, but she could. She's a phenomenal speaker as well as Brandon, and he's done an awesome job this morning. But we did go to school with them, and you know what? so crazy. Last night, we took them out to dinner, and um, he might tell you what else we did that they've never done before, but we were telling our kids on the way there, we were like, you know, Brandon and Becca, this is their old stomping ground, Joplin, because we all went to college here, and they were like, you went to college with Brandon and Becca? <laughs> we're like, yeah, we've known them for so long. And even they were reminding us that AJ and Ty, which is our little ones, when we had those kids, I was in college and Brad was in college and Becca babysit those two little boys who are now like ginormous young men almost. So we're super excited to have Brandon and Becca and their girls with us here. Will you guys give them a Mountain Movers round of applause? Get ready, ready for the word come. of God, people. It's coming. Well, I'll just tell you this. We'll just start off by saying that uh, Brad's a lot older than I am, all right? <laughs> Listen, trust me, he is, all right? All right, one question real quick before we, we can't go any farther until we answer this one question. Is it Boomer Sooner Country? Yes, all right. Or is it Oklahoma State Cowboy Country? Boomer Sooner, all right. That's what it was in first service. I'm excited, all right? I'm a Missouri Tiger fan, so don't hate me, all right? Man, we are, we're absolutely excited to be here. Um, we, man, for years, I've been, I, I've been observing Mount Movers Church and um, all that God's doing. And, uh, man, you guys are rocking it out, all right? Just so you know, like, you guys are killing it, uh, winning people, uh, seeing people's lives transformed, and that's what it's all about. Listen, the only thing that you can take to heaven with you is yourself and the people around you, all right? You don't ever see a uh, U-Haul following a hearse when you go to a funeral, do you? No, it doesn't happen like that, all right? So we uh, take the people with us to uh, heaven with us. So, man, you guys are rocking it out. It's awesome. Uh Last night, for the very first time ever, okay, our, our family got to experience a rodeo, all right? Go ahead. You can laugh. Come on. The more you laugh, the easier this whole uh, 45 minutes is going to be, all right? So, um, so it was a great time, all right? Uh, it was really cool. They did the steer wrestling, and uh, my wife was looked over at me and Brad Missy, and she's like, what's that? We're city people, all right, just so you know, all right? Not really. We live in a town of 1,300 or 1,600 people in Stillville, Missouri. We live on 130 acres uh, called the River Point Christian Camp. And it is our absolute honor uh, and privilege uh, to create an environment that students can come each and every single summer and can experience God. Uh, one of the coolest moments of last summer, and, and we did a recap video. Of, we baptized 71 kids one night, and it was really, really cool. Yeah, man, life change represented there, right? And uh, one of my favorite moments uh, was Willie, your all's youth pastor. Man, he's got a bear hug just wrapped around one of your all's students. And uh, what it shows me is this, two things, is that the power of God is real because somebody rededicated their life, 
but it also shows me this, that there's leaders and there's adults that are passing off the mantle or the baton to another generation. And the kingdom of God's only going to go as far as what we share it and what we tell it. Uh, and so that's what it's all about, is representing life change. And uh, it's a great deal. Man, my, my wife is here. Uh, she is 36 weeks pregnant, okay? Um, life's changing, okay? We have a 13-year-old, so pray with us. She's on the front row right where she needs to be at, all right, this morning. And uh, she's 13. We got a 7-year-old, and uh, we got one on the way. So just wish me luck because it's all girls, all right? So uh, not quite sure how that happened, but that's what God gave me, all right? So we're going to make do of the situation that we have, all right? Uh, but So with that said, let's jump in. Uh, this, this morning, for just a few moments, I'm going to talk to you about the concept or the thought of, of work your window. And uh, this window was really straight until me and Brad unloaded it at 11 o'clock last night in the dark, and I had to screw the legs on it, all right? So don't look at my craftsmanship. I'm not building Mountain Movers Church back here, I promise, all right? I'm just not doing it, all right? Um, so work your window. Man, when I was a young boy, my, uh, my dad... Uh, I was probably four or five years old. My dad said, hey, son, uh, I locked the keys in the house. I don't have a key to the house. Anybody ever been there? Okay, be honest. Okay, your wife already knows, all right? Just be honest, all right? And so he said, <laughs> there's a guy in the back pointing at her. He's like, she's right here, okay? And so, like, uh, he's like, there's only one thing to do, and there was a, a garage door window, single-pane window, and he said, I've got to bust out this window, and I've got to put you in this window, okay? Listen, I've always been a short, little stocky kid, so how I fit through the window that day was a, mirac- was a miracle from Jesus, all right? Uh, but that window was, was yay big and about yay wide, and Dad busted out that window, and he slid me in through that window, and we ran upstairs and unlocked the door, and he, he, he fixed the window, and Mom came home and said, why is the window bust out? And Dad's like, I forgot the keys. Fast forward 25 years later, what happens? Brandon's at their house. I forget the key to their house. So I'm like, hey, I've seen this done before, okay? This is like a, DI, D, or this is like a YouTube video I think I've seen done before, okay? And so what I do, I bust it out the window, and I slid my daughter through the window, okay? So what happened was dad came home, and he wasn't as happy with me as what he was with himself, all right? Why'd you bust out the window? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You'll do something as a parent, and you're like, no big deal, dude, I got this. But the second your kid does it, you're like, what are you doing, you idiot? <laughs> totally. Just that's how it works. I don't know why, but that's how it works. We've made the same mistakes, but then when our kids do it, it's like, man, what in the world? But the window that day provided us an opportunity to get into the house. We lock our doors on our home to not keep our stuff inside, but to keep the bad people out. And so that day, that window was the opportunity to get in. There's seasons in our lives that that God wants to do something, but the window's shut in our heart and in our lives. And so this morning, we're going to unpack the thought of what it means to open up our window and open up our lives so that faith can arise. You see, it doesn't matter what season of life that you're in. We all need the faith that God has given us to let hope rise inside of our lives. You may be far from God this morning, or you might be here and you might be a saint. But I can tell you this. Well, there's nobody here like that, all right, just so you know. But I can tell you this, that no matter what season of life that we're in, God has to come in and do the supernatural in our life, and then faith can begin to rise. So this morning, in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 8, and uh, verse 41 through 48, uh, we see a story of a lady who had a condition. And we're going to read this story. And you're going to, some of you guys in the, in the room, you're going to draw a com- um, parallel to it immediately and be like, man, I've heard this story growing up. I know all about it. But I want you to sit tight with me and uh, anticipate what God has for us this morning. Verse 41 says this, Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. Verse 43 says this, A woman in the crowd had suffered, or who, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with the, with the constant bleeding, and she could not find a cure. Coming up, coming up behind him, Jesus, 
or coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe, and immediately the bleeding stopped. Verse 45 says this, Who touched me, Jesus said. Everybody denied it. And Peter said, Master, the whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Somebody deliberately touched me, for I felt the healing power go from me to them. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble, and she fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard uh, her explaining why she had touched him, and that she she had been immediately healed. And verse 48 says this, Daughter, he said to her, this is Jesus, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Let's pray. Father, I thank you right now. God, for the opportunity, God, to speak your word. God, I pray that you open up our minds. God, you open up our heart. God, you open up our ears, God, to what you have for this morning. And God, we give you all of the praise and honor and glory, God, that we have the opportunity to be in your house this morning in Christ's name. And everybody said, amen, amen and amen. So to, to give a little scripture background, a little text background, we see that this woman had this condition, the Bible tells us, for 12 years. Many scholars will teach and, and tell us that, that this woman spent all of her money and all of her resources, all of her time for 12 years to try to find the cure for what was going on on the inside of her. And for 12 years, she'd go from this person to this person, and society had deemed her unclean or unpure, meaning that, that they wanted nothing to do with her. So for in this moment, for this lady to be in this crowd with all these people pressing for Jesus, Jesus, uh, for his attention, this lady had no business being there. No business at all. And so when, what society looked at and they said, you need, you're an outcast and you need to get away. This lady said, you know what? There's a window of opportunity for God to do something in my life. How many times is it that, that there's an opportunity for us to do it, but we just don't do it? There's an opportunity every single day for us to share the message of Christ with somebody. Do we always take the opportunity to do it? Because the window of opportunity sometimes is very, very small. It's only for a season. It's very, very short. And this woman knew that if she was going to have her miracle that day, it didn't matter what was going on around her. It didn't matter that Jesus was going to perform a miracle at somebody else's house and she was just walking by that day. She knew that her opportunity was there for him to do the miracle in her life the first point this morning is this is she wasn't afraid of who she was so many times we we deal with insecurities and we we deal with issues that that the devil always is coming up and he's knocking on our door hey you know what you're not good enough hey you know what your outward side it, it's not very pretty hey there you, you're not smart enough to have the job that you have hey you know what you're a horrible parent right now and what happens is we allow the devil to have room inside of our heart and inside of our life and we have to remember you know what Jesus Christ says I'm a child of the king Jesus Christ Christ says, you know what? He's right there with me. And because he's with me, I'm greater than who the devil or the enemy says that I am. I've come by to tell somebody this morning that you've got to let hope rise in your life. And you've got to say, you know what, devil? You ain't got no place inside of my heart. You don't have no place on the inside of my life. Jesus Christ went to the cross and he paid the debt that I could never be, I could never pay. And I'm a child of the king this morning. Amen. Oh, come on. Give him a hand clap. Come on. We place restrictions on God based upon our judgment of ourselves. The worst critic in your life is yourself. This woman that day, she could have said, you know what, man, for 12 years, I've just been sitting here. I've just been chilling out. There's been no cure, no hope. I've tried every doctor. I've tried every situation. And you know what? I'm stuck right where I'm at. But that lady got up and said, you know what? Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. And I'm going to let something rise up on the inside of me because there's a window of opportunity because Jesus is passing by. He may be going to do something else. But I'm confident on the inside of me that God is going to heal me that day. You know, in her mind, she had to be thinking. Listen to me. She had to be thinking, man, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Man, is this really going to work? 
Man, is, is, is this miracle? Is this really going to work? I'm just touching his clothes. I'm not even having him pray over me. He's not even laying hands on me because Jesus would lay hands on the sick and they'd be healed immediately. All I'm trying to do is just touch him and my body's going to be made, healed, made pure. How does this work? And there had to be some skepticism in her mind to think, is this even possible? How many times in our own mind do we, do we discount God? Well, God can't save me. You don't know what my past looks like. Man, if I ever walk into that church, that place is going to burn down. Listen, you're here today, and the place didn't burn down. Right? Man, man if, 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 if the doctors have said that, that my daughter's already sick, and, and I'm just going to take the report of the doctor, I'm not even going to believe what the Word of God has to say. Listen to me. If you're, a child of the, if you're the child of the King, God's right there with you. He's walking this journey of life with you, saying, you know what? I've got you. I've got you covered. When you're going through a difficult season, I'm right there with you. I'm never going to leave you, and I'm never going to forsake you. I am with you. So you've got to stop believing what the world says. You've got to say, you know what? I'm a child of God. I'm I'm going to let my faith and my hope rise just because I'm a child of God this morning. Amen? Amen. The second thing that we see is she wanted to go unnoticed, but she got noticed. She wanted to go unnoticed, but she got noticed. You know, I was at a conference last week, and they brought a sociologist in there, and he talked about that we are the most connected generation of all time but in our culture right now worry and anxiety and depression runs rapid because we feel like nobody cares about us in a matter of a moment right here right here the first service was ending i was texting my wife hey babe you ready i'm coming to get you and within a matter of moments i had a response i didn't have to call her i didn't have to pick the phone up but technology is just at our fingertips and everything that we do but on the inside of us we feel like nobody knows who we are nobody knows the struggle that we're going through nobody knows the difficulty that we're going through nobody knows that the, the battles that we're facing Listen, the only person that's got to notice your battle, the only person that's got to notice your struggle is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So when you're going through a difficult moment, don't call the, don't call the gossip line, but get on your hands and your knees and pull out your Bible and say, you know what, I'm going to find out what the Word of God says about me. I'm going to find out what God says on how to deal with the issues that I'm facing. And God, I'm going to put you first in my life. This woman... We automatically know that she was noticed by Jesus because the first thing Jesus said was, who touched me? I live in a house of three women and one on the way. And let me tell you something. They want to be in my bubble all the time. The only person in this little circle is me and Jesus, all right? I don't need nobody else coming up and popping that bubble, all right? My daughter's in the front row and she's laughing. But so many times, so many times, they want to run up and they want dad to be the jungle gym and, and we carry Brooklyn to bed and she's flipping all around me and I'm like, girl, can you just get off? You're seven years old. You weigh a little too much now. Can you just hop off? I'm struggling. You broke my back. And so this little bubble, I, I don't want anybody in. Listen, can you imagine what it was like for Jesus that day as people were crashing into him? The Bible tells us that people were pressing up against him. Everywhere that Jesus went, it drew a crowd. And everywhere that on this day, as he was making this journey, people were just bumping into him. And immediately when this lady touched Jesus, he stops everything. Who touched me? Who touched me? And he knew immediately that something had left his body and it had healed this lady's situation. Something had left his body and immediately, immediately, the Bible tells us, not three years from now, not in ten months, but immediately something miraculously happened. And Jesus noticed it. He stopped everything. The lady dropped to her knees and began to bawl and began to 
basically tell Jesus she was sorry. And Jesus said, lady, I've made you heal. I've made you well. You need to rise up and you need to go along your way. Listen, I don't know what you're bringing to the foot of the cross this morning. I don't know what battles that you faced this week on your nine to five job. But I can tell you this, that the blood of Jesus, the, the hope that we have in Christ our Lord and Savior is sufficient, not just for me, not just for your pastors, not just for my family, but the blood of Jesus and the hope we have in Jesus. Jesus is sufficient for all. So you better look up at the devil and say, you know what? I may be unnoticed by man, but God knows my name. He knows that I am a child of God. This week we were traveling, and my, my daughter, I got a haircut, okay? I got a haircut. I knew I was coming here today. I didn't look my absolute best, all right? Just for you, all right? I was going to wear a tie, but they told me not to. Listen, that's a lie. I don't wear ties, all right? I don't even own a tie. We gave all my ties to Goodwill or somebody. But just this week, my daughter, we were driving, and she said, Dad, how many hairs were on your head? And I said that smart elk remark, oh, I don't know, but God knows, you know. And next thing you know, she pulls out her phone, and she looks it up. You were born with 100,000 hairs on your head. And the Bible tells us that God knows how many hairs you have on your head right now. Okay, some people, not that many, okay? <laughs> this guy over here's got like four, I think, all right? <laughs> but God knows. We live in a world that's go, 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 go. God knows who you are. He knows the mountaintop that you're on right now. He knows the valley that you're in. You know what he's waiting on? He's waiting on you. And he's waiting on me to come to the Father and say, Father, I'm here. God, I'm, I'm here. I know that you've never left me, but I've walked away from you, and I'm back. I need you right now in this season of my life. I need you to meet my need. I need to spend time with you. I need to draw close to you. I need a miracle in my life. We realized that her faith was bigger than her situation. Her faith was bigger than her situation. I shared with them, in first service, and it wasn't in my notes, and my wife might kill me when we leave. But my daughter, our seven-year-old daughter, has recently just been just wrecked with some headaches, waking her up in the middle of the night, the whole deal, taking her to some doctor's appointments, and we got some more coming. And I was driving just the other day and just praying, knowing we were coming here and praying over our family. I, I, I pray for a lot of people, but if I don't pray for my family, I've missed the mark. And so, to me, it's like, man, i got to really pray for these guys. Breeze in middle school, things are changing. A lot of, lot of responsibilities with sports and homework, and God bless them and all they do. Um, but I was praying, and Becca was sleeping. She's 36 weeks pregnant, so she sleeps like uh, 20 hours out of the 24-hour day, all right? It's like hibernation all the time, all right? And I was driving, and she woke up for like three seconds. No, I'm just kidding. And I looked over at her, and I said, babe, this deal, Brooklyn, it's going to be all right. Because I had let my faith shrink because of the fear of the unknown. We don't know what's causing it. We don't know what's going on. But I can tell you this, my, my window was completely closed on my faith. There was no hope. There was no, well, you're, you're a minister. You're a pastor. You're, you're a camp director. You inspire our kids. How is it that your window's closed? Listen, I'm a human being just like you are. And the devil comes knocking on our doors and saying, you know what? There's no hope in that situation. You know what? You better get online and start reading about what you can do on your side. Listen, I choose to put my faith in Jesus Christ. And on that day, we were driving that car. I looked over at her and said, babe, everything's going to be all right. I don't know what the outcome is. I don't know what valley we might have to walk through. But I can tell you this. He's never going to leave me and he's never going to forsake me. Everything is going to be all right. Here's what happens inside of our life when we let faith rise. You see, when the window is shut, there's absolutely no opportunity for God to move. God is not going to move. This is our thinking. He's not going to move. He's not going to do it. He did that for them, but there's no way that he can do that for me now. And we close off the complete opportunity for God to do something in our life. The next stage is this. I locked it. Somebody locked it. Is it's cracked. One of my favorite things to do in the fall is to just 
crack a window, shut off all the, the air and the heat in the house and, and just crack a window. Why? Because just a little bit, oh, come on, somebody, just a little bit of that breeze comes in the house and it begins to cool the house. It begins to knock off the humidity in the house. Just a little bit. When there's just a little bit, you know what we're thinking? You know what? I think God might be able to move on my behalf. I think that maybe, just possibly, maybe God will perform the miracle I need. You know what? Maybe in my situation, God God will meet me there. You know what? Maybe God can't save me. You know what? Maybe I, maybe I haven't committed too many sins for God not to love me. And then all of a sudden, the window opens up a little bit more. And it's like, oh, man, I know, I know that, man, that there really is a chance that this is going to work in my favor. I know that there's a chance that God's going to meet my need. And then all of a sudden, the window's fully open. And it says, you know what? I, he is going to meet my need. He is going to be with me. No matter what the outcome might be, no matter what the doctor might say my window of opportunity is open and God is going to work on my behalf I choose to live my life with the mindset of God is going to work out the details God is going to work out the miracle and all he's asking me to do is to open up my heart open up my mind and let him have room in my life amen that's all he's asking that's all he's asking is to have room in our life. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, we see a story or a, a set of scriptures that talks about giving. I'm not here to talk about giving. But what I'm here to talk to you about is this, is that when we're faithful to God, God is faithful to us in return. Amen? We could pass this microphone all around this room this morning and talk about the faithfulness of God. And what happens, the Bible tells us, is that when I'm faithful to God, the Bible tells us that God will open up the windows of heaven and we will receive a blessing that we cannot contain so i choose to put my perspective on the things of god amen amen Amen. last point for you this morning is this is this lady was expecting she didn't just hope it would work she didn't just hope that maybe things would go her way But she knew that she was expecting a miracle on that day. Listen to me. When I go to Chick-fil-A and get some Jesus chicken, okay? And if you don't like Chick-fil-A, I'm sorry, but I'm going to use it for this illustration, all right? And I, I pull up to the window. Come on, somebody. When I pull up to, not the window, to that little speaker thing, whatever that thing's called. And that lady talks back to me, and it's kind of weird, all right? And I pull up to that to order, and I said, I want a number one with no pickles. Listen, all pickles is a cucumber gone bad, all right? (laughs) That's all it is. Who decides to put something in vinegar and be like, oh, we got a new invention? No, you didn't. You just let the pickles spoil in vinegar. That's all you did, all right? My daughter, she's like a pickle fanatic. She's probably really mad right now, all right? Sorry to disappoint you, babe. And I order that number one. I lost my train of thought. That number one with waffle fries and a Diet Coke to make me feel better about myself, all right? Listen, you cross over 30, you got to hit on that diet soda, okay, if you're going to drink it, all right? Listen, even, dead serious, even Chick-fil-A is keto approved for Brad and Misty, all right? Just So if you're ever, like, wondering what they do, it's Chick-fil-A all the time, all right? So we pull up to this window and I or to this, this ordering device and I order what I want. When I get to that window, I'm expecting something to be that I ordered. Amen? I don't want to get up to that window and a number eight be in my bag. I don't want to get up to that window and Taco Bell be in my bag. I don't want to get up to that window and Burger King be in my bag. What I want is what I ordered at the window. Amen? Yeah. Oh, come on, you you got to get with me. Amen? Amen. So when I cruise up to the window, and I know I'm on the wrong side because it should be on this side, right? (laughs) And I give that lady my $8.57. I'm expecting that number one to be in that bag. Why is it that when it comes to the things of God, oh, come on, somebody. 
Why is it that when we come to the things of God and we read all throughout Scripture about the goodness of God and God performing miracle after miracle and God meeting needs and and God talking about the provisions and the blessings that He has for our life, we somehow exclude ourselves from that. Why? Because we're not expecting God to do that for us. I choose to live my life expecting the window to be open and God to do the supernatural inside of my life. It's my job. It's your job to be faithful to God. How am I faithful to God? Every day I'm spending time with God. Every day I hope you're spending time with God. Every single time the doors of this church are open, man, you need to be busting it down, being in the house of God. How else do we serve God? We serve God with our talents and our resources. We serve God by, by, by serving others. Listen, you want to talk about the most humbling thing? Go serve somebody else. And what we're doing is is we're creating opportunities for God to do the supernatural in our life. If I do nothing and I just sit over here and I'm like, well, God, I'm mad because you blessed that person. You see the car that person's driving? You see the house that person's living? You see that, that, that you healed them when they were sick? You see this and you see that? Listen, you're not expecting. You're not expecting. But I choose to live my life through the lens of expecting. So this morning, no matter what season of life that you're in, you have got to let hope rise. You've got to let your faith, faith rise in your life. You've got to say, God, you know what? In this season of my life I'm in right now, I choose to put you first. Amen. As I close this morning, last, last June, right before camp, if you, our camp schedule is really, really crazy. Brad and Misty can tell you that. Your team can tell you that. Uh, in a beer league softball game, I wasn't drinking beer. I was just playing softball, okay? Playing softball, I jacked my knee up. I was the only sober guy on the whole softball field. And I only went, listen to me, I only went that night. It was one night before our intern showed up for summer camp. I only went that one night because there's a guy in our community I'm trying to win to Christ. And I I just felt like he's my guy. Anybody ever feel like that with somebody? You're my person. I, I coach youth baseball with this guy. One night after a ball game, he chewed his son out for two hours the whole ball game, yelled and screamed. We sat on the back of that guy's truck for an hour and a half one night as he talked to me, man, I'm a horrible dad. Man, I've let my kids down. Man, I'm an alcoholic. I'm this. I'm all that. I'm this. Just, just on and on. So the moments that this guy calls me and says, hey, I'm going to go play softball, man, I jump at it because he's my guy. Has he come to crush it? No, but I'm still working. He's still a work in progress, right? We're all still a work in progress. And so I, I tear my leg up dr- drastically. Tear my knee up going for surgery in August after camp, all throughout camp. Brad's like, yeah, we were there. They bought the t-shirt too. I signed it. <laughs> the, whole, the whole month, the whole summer, camp ended. Went and had surgery. Woke up from surgery that day with a brace from here to here. Locked out for three months, couldn't move. My wife, I learned to be dependent upon her for almost everything. And what happened? In my mind, fear, anxiety, worry, depression began to squeeze in. Why? Because the devil knew. Man, I'm a, I'm a go, 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 go. We drive about 75,000 miles a year doing our job. Spend nights all the time on the road. We just go. But in that season, I was just there. No place to go. No place to turn. And I was driving. I got clear to drive. I was actually driving before I was supposed to drive, which that was a whole other story. <laughs> Listen to your doctors, okay? I was driving. And uh, Elevation had just released a new song and a new album. And I sat there in that truck that day. Tears flowing down my face. It says, I can't go back to where I started. But from this day on, we're moving forward. Tears flowing down my face. God, pure accident I wound up in this situation. But I've taken my eyes off the creator of the universe and my perspective has changed. I don't know what you're struggling with this morning. But I can tell you this. You've got to put your eyes on him. You've got to turn, listen to me, you've got to turn your, worship, your worry into your worship. And you've got to change your perspective. And you've got to say, God, 
I'm open up to the things of you. I don't see it with my own eyes. I can't even see it in my own brain, this little three-pound brain. But what I know is this, is that when I'm faithful to you, you're going to be faithful to me in return. On this side of heaven, things might not look like there's hope in the situation. But when I realign my perspective and I say, God, here I am. I believe what you say about me. God, I believe that I have hope in you. So whatever season of life that you're in right now, whether you're on the mountaintop or you're in a valley, God wants room in your heart. I, I, I truly believe that the lady in Luke, that we really don't even know who her name is or what her name is, I think that what, what healed her was this was her persistency to get to Jesus. One of the one of the points I had that I didn't even share, I cut out the other day, was the lady eliminated distractions in her life. Man, this thing's always buzzing. It's always going off. It's always ringing. There's always a notification, notification coming off. Listen, shut that sucker off and set it down and say, you know what? I don't need that for a day. I don't need that for a few days. Because God, my relationship with you, I've got to see a miracle. I've got to see something different than what I'm seeing right now. We've got to open up the windows of our heart and say, God, come in. Let's pray this morning. God, I thank you right now. God, that you're the hope of our lives. You're the hope of our situation. God, no matter where we are in our life right now, God, I pray that you meet us here this morning. God, have your way. God, you said in your word, God, that if we would cast our cares upon you, that you're there for us. You haven't left us. You haven't forsaken us. God, but you are here. God, you're in our homes. You're in our automobiles. God, everywhere that we are, God, your spirit is with us. God, I pray, God, right now, God, that whatever we're struggling with in this place, God, we we learn to let hope rise and we open up the windows of our heart and see our life through the lens of faith you to have your way. We thank you right now in Christ's name. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, we want to give you that opportunity. The Bible tells us that if we believe with our heart, confess with our mouth that we can be saved. This guy Jesus that was walking by this lady in Luke 6 that or Luke 8 that miraculously healed her is the same guy that would later go to die upon a cross and pay a debt that we could never repay so that we could have forgiveness of our sins and all the bad things we've ever done. So if you're here this morning and you're like, man, I need that hope. I need that guy in my life. We're going to pray a prayer in just a second. And I want you to, I want everybody in the house to repeat after me this morning because you might be the person that encourages the person on the right of you or on the left of you to pray the prayer of salvation this morning. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, I pray that you come into my heart and come into my life. And dear Jesus, I pray that hope rises. And God, I invite you in and I open up my window. In Christ's name. Thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, 
or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.